this episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. I'd like to welcome everybody to today's presentation on sleep disturbances, the impact and intervention. Y'all know this is one of my favorite topics, partly because I just love to sleep. But we're going to learn about sleep, its function, the sleep cycles, how much is enough, and how lack of sleep contributes to feelings of depression, anxiety, and irritability, and that ever-present HPA axis activation. We want to help people understand the connection between sleep and circadian rhythms. They're not the same thing. Your circadian rhythms are really your cortisol levels and your hormone levels, whereas sleep is a byproduct of those. And we are going to focus on techniques for sleep hygiene. Most of our clients, or actually most of us, everybody, um, we really don't have good sleep hygiene. And most of us are not willing to do everything we need to do to have perfect sleep hygiene. However, we can talk about uh, mitigating some of the factors that may be impairing our sleep. People who hurt. People whose circadian rhythms are off have a difficult time getting restful sleep. Our circadian rhythms help set in our body when our body releases cortisol and when that cortisol level drops, when our body creates melatonin to help us drift off to sleep, and when it doesn't. So if our circadian rhythms are out of whack, then our body's not going to be waking us up. You know, cortisol surges in the morning, and that's our get out of bed. We need a little bit of cortisol. We call it the stress hormone, but we need a little bit of it to get us motivated to get up in the morning. But if it's peaking in the evening, then we're not going to have that melatonin secretion that helps us drift off to sleep. Our circadian rhythms are really important. Now, one of the quirky little things is the fact that our circadian rhythms are not 24 hours. They're actually, I believe, like 26 hours, which means if just left to its own devices, we would be on a 26 hour cycle. Well, that's not how the days work and that's not how our society is designed. So we rely on cues from the environment to help us set our circadian rhythms. And one of those, the biggest cues that we rely on is light. We're going to talk more about that. People whose circadian rhythms are off usually have higher cortisol levels overall. The body doesn't know when it's supposed to be awake and when it's supposed to sleep, which cause when we experience sleep disruption, it causes our cortisol levels to go up. Our brain's going, okay, there must be a threat or I don't know. I don't know why you're not sleeping enough, but since you're tired, I need to help you stay awake because now you are more vulnerable. Basically is what they surmise may be happening, but we do know that sleep deprivation leads to higher cortisol levels. When people's circadian rhythms are off, they report being tired at all the wrong times. Have you ever felt jet lag? You know, that's your circadian rhythm being off. You're, you're tired when your body thinks it's time to go to sleep and you're wired when your body thinks it's time to be awake. Um, I think it was yesterday or the day before somebody shared a, a a picture on Facebook and evidently the sun just set in Alaska and it's going to be dark in Alaska for 60 days or something. I don't, I don't remember what he said, but I know it's a long stinking time. And again, since light is contributes to helping us set our circadian rhythms, it's hard for those people. It's hard for people with visual impairments because they may not be getting the sensory input. It's hard for shift workers. Oh my gosh, let's talk about shift workers. And it's hard for, well, hard for people who um, have children at home, you know, especially infants, and you're up and down all night long. The baby needs to eat every four hours or whatever initially. And, you know, we understand this, but it also disrupts the uh, caregivers circadian rhythms. And I say caregivers, plural, because it's not just the mother and it's not just whoever gets up and feeds the baby. Whoever is awakened by that, um, by that feeding time is potentially going to have their circadian rhythm disrupted. 
which means, you know, in any of those circumstances, you can be tired at all the wrong times. You don't know when to be awake, uh, which means you may have difficulty concentrating. When, you're, when you have good sleep your, and your circadian rhythms are in whack, if you will, if that's even a term, uh, your body clears out the adenosine, which is the byproduct of um, energy production in the brain. When adenosine levels build up, we get sleepy, which is one of those reasons if you've sat in, in a class for eight hours before and you walk out of there and you feel completely exhausted and you're like, I was just sitting still all day long. Well, the interesting thing is there's a reason for that. Your brain was working so hard all day and you can pat yourself on the back if you walk out of a class that you sat in for eight hours and you're exhausted. Um, the blood glucose and the activity of your brain while sitting in that class caused the buildup of adenosine, which is the byproduct of work, and that increases what they call sleep pressure, which means as soon as it builds up to certain levels, your brain says, yeah, it's time to take a nappy nap. Another thing that happens in people, who, people whose circadian rhythms are off is they confuse sleep and hunger cues. Those cues are really pretty similar. And if you don't pay attention, if you're not very cognizant of what's going on, you may confuse those cues. Some people will eat to stay awake. You know, if I just have something to get my blood sugar up, I can stay awake. Some people help eat to help them fall asleep. You know, if I just have a little something on my stomach, I won't be hungry and then I can fall asleep. And some people eat in both cases. And, and we see this a lot in people who, especially shift workers, they're not sure if they're hungry or sleepy. They're not sure what their body needs. They just feel, oh, awful. And that's because of the sleep disturbance and all of their hormones being out of whack. Your circadian rhythms, in addition to setting your cortisol and your um, uh, melatonin levels, also sets your ghrelin and leptin levels, which are your hunger and satiation hormones. If you keep a relatively stable schedule, most of us uh, will experience about the same time every day hunger pangs. Ha ha, that's that circadian rhythm going 12 hours or 24 hours ago at this time you were eating, so it's time to eat again. And, you know, if you keep that schedule, then your body cues in and that's when those hormones are released. People with depression who tend to eat in order to help them feel better. A lot of times they're also not getting quality sleep and their ghrelin and leptin levels are out of whack, which again is part of that circadian rhythm disruption. Sleep is the time to rest and restore. Adequate sleep improves memory and learning, increases attention and creativity, and aids in concentration and decision making. That makes me want to go to sleep right now. But the key is it's adequate quality sleep, and that doesn't mean taking multiple naps throughout the day. That means getting really good, restorative, clear-my-head sleep for that period during the night. Toxins that accumulate in the brain are thought to be cleared out during sleep, and healing and repair of cells takes place during sleep. Sleep helps the body to maintain the balance of hormones in the, in the body, including ghrelin and leptin, which regulate feelings of hunger and fullness, and insulin, which is responsible for the regulation of glucose in the blood. If you're working with a client who is pre-diabetic or diabetic, sleep deprivation and getting those circadian rhythms out of whack are going to impact their um, insulin levels and their blood sugar levels. They're going to be more reactive when the person is not getting adequate quality restorative sleep. Sleep deficiency is also linked to a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, stroke, diabetes, and kidney disease. Part of that, they think, is because, and it, we're not sure whether it's causative or correlational, you know, we haven't figured out a causative factor, but we know that people who tend to be sleep deprived tend to have a higher risk of these disorders. We know that when you're sleep deprived, your HPA axis, your threat response system is ramped up which you can see where that could contribute to cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, stroke. Um, but we also wonder 
whether it's you know bi-directional whether somebody with who tends to be um more type a tends to be more high strung cognitively stressed out tends to sleep less which means that because of their type a personality we will say they may be more at risk for high blood pressure but that also makes them more at risk for sleep deficiency so there's no causal nature but we do know that people who have sleep deficiency are at higher risk for these things and sleep deprivation is also correlated to difficulty concentrating irritability and fatigue and loss of energy fatigue is not just sleepiness and you know i think most of us remember that but i do want to just reiterate it sleepiness is sleepiness but fatigue and loss of energy and psychomotor retardation as the dsm used to say um can mean feeling like your body just weighs a thousand pounds you know it's going upstairs to do something or walking into the kitchen feels like it takes so much energy than more so than it than it usually does and sleep de deprivation is correlated with some of those things when your body's not resting restoring repairing it's starting to um, It'll, it'll eventually start having more difficulty functioning which you know makes everything harder our sleep cycles and this isn't super important but it is curious um stage one your non-rem sleep is when you drift in and out of light sleep and can easily be awakened this is kind of when you nap now the sleep foundation recommends that if you're going to nap you keep it to less than 30 minutes because generally your first 30 minutes of sleep is non-rem sleep um, stage two non-rem brain waves slow with intermittent bursts of rapid brain waves the eyes stop moving body temperature drops because we need to be cool to sleep not warm <laughs> cool and the heart rate begins to slow down this stage usually lasts for approximately 20 minutes now remember we cycle throughout this cycle multiple times throughout the night in stage three non-rem sleep also known as deep sleep or delta sleep you have very slow brain waves there's no voluntary movement and you're difficult to wake you are as they say sometimes dead to the world this stage also lasts for approximately 30 minutes and the largest percentage comes in the early part of the total night sleep pattern during this stage of sleep is when it's clearing out that adenosine and stuff and which makes sense that it's the beginning of the night the less sweeping and cleaning that needs to be done the less deep sleep that you need so initially your body is just you know gung-ho let's go ahead and you know dust out all of those cobwebs and then towards the end of the night you don't need as much um, REM sleep or your rapid eye movement is characterized by temporary paralysis of the voluntary muscles and fast irregular breathing inability to regulate body temperature faster brain waves resembling the activity of a person that's awake and this is when most dreams occur and as i've said before your fitness trackers are really not good monitors of your slow um, deep sleep and your rem sleep and your light sleep uh, because you have paral paralysis of your voluntary muscles in rem sleep and i can look at my fitness tracker and it says I was in REM sleep, but it has my movement like all over the place. I'm like, mm, no, I don't think so. Uh, so don't put too much stock in this. Like I said, just if people are wanting to use it, encourage them to use it as a barometer so they can figure out what they need in each level in order to feel their most rested according to that device. How much sleep do we need? and most of you when i've taught this class before people have been like oh you know none of us are getting that much well we're not and that is one of the things that's contributing to a lot of our um, chronic illnesses but newborns need 12 to 18 hours of sleep a day okay most newborns get that three months to one year old 14 to 15 hours i know a lot of toddlers that may not get that um, because that means maybe going to bed at 6 p.m., getting up at 6 a.m. to get to daycare, and then taking a two-hour nap during the day. One to three years old, 12 to 14 hours of sleep. 
So thinking of your average child who's going to daycare, they need to be up by six. So they go to bed at eight, that gives them 10 hours. And then if they're lucky at school, they get another two hour nap. A lot of times that they don't get two hour naps. Five to 12 years old, this is elementary school. They need 10 to 11 hours of sleep. So if, if they're having to get up to meet the bus and get to school, they're having to get up by six, then they need to be in bed ideally by and asleep not just in bed but asleep by eight o'clock 12 to 18 years old and this is where we start hitting bugaboos when they're younger we can cajole them to getting in bed at what we consider a reasonable hour and a lot of times they're not distracted on their mobile devices or with anxieties or whatever so they drift off to sleep easier when uh, youth get into middle school and high school they still need eight and a half to ten hours of sleep now i don't know about you but when i was in high school i wasn't getting anywhere near that you know i yeah i digress um, and and teenagers these days and and youth these days aren't either now they may not be out they may be playing video games they may be on their mobile devices they may be just laying in bed fretting and worrying but most youth do not get the minimum eight and a half hours of sleep every night a lot of high schools are actually starting to start later in order to accommodate the natural rhythms of the teenage brain but just because school is starting later people think well that gives me the opportunity to stay up an hour later no that kind of defeats the purpose the whole purpose was to help you start getting eight and a half hours of sleep and then over 18 years old that means all of us and that includes people who are considered older adults their need for sleep does not go down uh, we need seven and a half to nine hours of quality sleep per night and it's really important to recognize that if you've got somebody for example who wakes up three or four times in the night to go to the bathroom you know that's disrupting their sleep they're not getting a good solid seven and a half hours if they're up every three hours to go to the bathroom um, or because the dog has to go out or whatever it is we do need to pay attention to that and if we're not able to get seven and a half hours of solid sleep if you've got an infant in the house or a puppy in the house or you're sick or whatever it is okay well, recognize that you are going to be in a state of sleep deprivation and what can you do to be kind to yourself and buffer against that and then how can you adjust it so you can get back on a sleep schedule I was very blessed when both of my children were infants and my husband was on midnight shift so I would go to sleep and I would do, you know, the last feeding at like eight o'clock or something, then I would go to sleep. He'd take the next two feedings so I could get a solid, you know, seven, eight hours of sleep, if I was lucky, um, at least three or four days a week. And then the other times, you know, I would stay up and do it. But that made it better for us because half the time I was able to get a good solid eight hours sleep and hormones estrogen improves the quality of sleep reduces the time to fall asleep and increases the amount of REM sleep I didn't know that um, I guess estrogen can be your friend even though it tends to be an excitatory hormone it does for some reason uh, is associated with improved quality of sleep now if you remember from the hormone presentation we did a couple weeks ago all estrogen is not created equal don't just assume that increasing estrogen is going to make your life better it's all about balance and you need to have it at the right level in comparison with uh, testosterone progesterone you know all your other gonadal hormones too much or too little testosterone also affects overall sleep quality cortisol which is the stress hormone prevents restful sleep cortisol when it's secreted is tells you that that HPA axis is activated that threat response system so your body is saying now is not the time to be caught unawares now is not the time to get restful sleep you may doze on and off like a soldier in a foxhole but you are not going to get that deep you know I can let myself just be relaxed sleep 
And thyroid hormones, which are too high, can cause insomnia, and too low can cause fatigue and lethargy. Hypothyroid tends to look a lot like depression. People who have hypothyroid tend to have cold intolerance, be sleepier, use more stimulants like caffeine, and have more of a disrupted circadian rhythm. Nutrition. Nutrition also impacts sleep. If you don't eat well, you're not going to give your body the building blocks it needs to function well. Tryptophan is a protein. It's an amino acid that's used to make serotonin. Serotonin is broken down to make melatonin. Melatonin helps you feel sleepy. Thinking of a lot of people that have depression and their serotonin levels are imbalanced. It may be too high, maybe too low, but their serotonin levels are imbalanced. Then they may have imbalanced levels of melatonin. Additionally, to break down serotonin, well, to break down tryptophan to make serotonin and to break down serotonin to make melatonin, you have to have all kinds of vitamins and minerals, including calcium and iron and B6 and other things, which is why a rounded, well-rounded nutritional diet is important. And, you know, like I tell my son, used to tell my son, um, you know, if the only green vegetable you'll eat right now is peas, well, then we're going to have peas every night because I think it's important for you to have that color in your palate, if you will. And at our house, we tend to eat colorfully instead of focusing as much on food groups. But, you know, talking with the dietitian, they can work that out. Caffeine is a stimulant with at least a six-hour half-life. Older people, it takes longer because the liver doesn't clear it out as fast. Um, if you're dehydrated, it takes longer because it's not being washed out, yada, yada. But figure about six-hour half-life. That means for about half of the caffeine you drank or consumed to get out of your system, it takes six hours. So 12 hours to get completely out of your system. If you drink caffeine, if you have Starbucks at 12 at noon, then at midnight, it's just then getting out of your system where it's not disrupting your sleep at all. Nicotine has a two-hour half-life. So if you smoke after dinner, you know, you eat dinner at six and you have a cigarette or three after dinner, um, then it's going to be 1030, you know. Ha two hour half life, so a four hour full life, it'll be 10 30 or so before that completely gets out of your system. Decongestants also have a two hour half life. You take them every four hours. Um, you know, when you're sick, you may opt to take the decongestant so you don't, so you can actually breathe, which might help you sleep. But being aware that de decongestants will also impact the quality of your sleep as well as being all snotted up. But antihistamines, your Benadryls and your, your allergy medicines can make you drowsy but contribute to poor quality sleep. They'll help you drift off, but they found that the quality of sleep is less than, than stellar. And alcohol initially will help people drift off to sleep and may improve sleep in the first half of the night, but the last half of the night, it disrupts sleep. And it blocks REM sleep, and it can int intensify sleep apnea. So if somebody is already a hard snorer, then alcohol may actually um, push them kind of over that edge to where they are having obstructive sleep apnea symptoms. Eating a high-protein dinner may ensure that you have enough tryptophan in the body, you also want to make sure you have enough selenium, vitamin D, calcium, vitamin A, magnesium, and zinc. And you're like, oh my gosh, where do all those things come from? Well, if you click on the links, it takes you to the, to the website, World's Healthiest Foods. You can find some foods to consider including in your diet. Some people will uh, default to taking a multivitamin. Now, the little spiel that I've been given on multivitamins and that I give is that our body is much more adept at accessing and using uh, vitamins and minerals and nutrients that come from natural foods because they're in the right proportion to one another. You know, calcium and vitamin D are in the right proportion instead of both at 50% or something. And that makes it easier for, for the body to use and to effectively 
do what it needs to do. However, you know, some people are just not going to get all of their nutrients and their doctor may recommend a multivitamin. Sleep allows the brain to focus on re rebuilding and repairing. Animals deprived entirely of sleep lose all immune function in, and die in just a matter of weeks. Now, very rarely, if ever, unless you're, you know, in a really, really bad situation, are we de deprived entirely of sleep for days or weeks on end. But there are people, you know, they used to do it with uh, residents in hospitals where the residents would be on for 36 hours straight or 72 hours straight, which I always wondered, you know, I wasn't really eager to have some intern working on me that had been up for three days straight, but <laughs> I digress. Uh, we start to lose our immune functioning when we're not getting enough quality sleep, which is why during finals week, people tend to get more illnesses. And during the holidays, people tend to get more illnesses because they're going to holiday parties and doing stuff and they're kind of running full bore, may not be getting enough sleep. So their immune system may be worn down a little bit. And then they're interacting with, you know, family members that have come in from Timbuktu that are bringing in the bugga buggas from Timbuktu and, you know, with a reduced immune system and exposure to foreign germs, um, it's easier to get sick. So we do encourage people to, if they're not going to get better sleep for any other reason, but to avoid getting sick, do that. Prisoners who are deprived of sleep entirely often develop psychotic symptoms. That's not after one day or even two days, but we, there is a definite, um, increase in psychotic breaks at a certain period of time. So when we look at prisoners of war, for example, we can see a lot more psycho psychotic symptoms. New parents deprived of sleep have difficulty with memory and concentration. When I was, you know, a young parent, I used to call it mommy brain and, you know, kind of laugh about it. But it actually is true because we're not clearing out that adenosine. Muscle growth, tissue repair, protein synthesis, and growth hormone release occur mostly, or in some case, cases only, during sleep. So some of these things, I mean, all of these things, muscle, muscle growth, tissue repair, protein synthesis, and growth hormone are really important for not only staying healthy, but anti-aging, which is another reason that I'm a big proponent of sleep because, you know, I'm going to fight aging as much as I can. Other rejuvenating aspects of sleep are specific to the brain and cognitive function. When we're awake, neurons in the brain produce adenosine. The buildup of adenosine leads to the perception of being tired or that sleep pressure that we talked about. As I told you earlier, our internal body clock is not a typical 24-hour cycle. The patterns of brainwave activity, hormone production, cell regeneration, and other biological activities are linked to what we have created or what we have morphed into a 24-hour cycle. Our normal circadian clock for humans based in industrial nations is set by the light-dark cycle over 24 hours. We've trained our brains to kind of reset itself. Circadian rhythms allow organisms to anticipate and prepare for precise and regular environmental changes in order to best capitalize on environmental resources. When it's light, we can farm, we can hunt. When it's dark, we don't see so good, so we're not great hunters. We might as well go to sleep. Circadian rhythm disorders may be caused by many factors, including shift work, pregnancy, time zone changes, medications, changes in routines, such as staying up late or sleeping in for multiple days in a row. You know, think about when you go on uh, vacation. And you're sleeping in until, you know, whenever you sleep into. For me, anytime after 5.30, I'm just like, wait, wow, where'd half the day go? Medical problems, including Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, can in interrupt circadian rhythms, and mental health issues. We know a lot of people with depression have difficulty sleeping through the night. Same thing with anxiety. We want to explore the effects of insufficient sleep on energy allocation and how it disrupts normal hormonal rhythms. 
and this is includes you know sleep disruption disrupts our estrogen testosterone progesterone levels all that kind of stuff which can make people a little bit more depressed moody whatever depending on which hormone gets out of whack the most excessive sleep disrupts normal hormonal rhythms as well if you're sleeping too much then you know your body's not getting that burst of cortisol and the normal gradual decline over the 24-hour period and excessive sleep can also make you sleepier due to lack of movement and light for our clients who are depressed who you know sit on the couch and binge watch net netflix or for people who are on bed rest um, it's easy to get even sleepier the more sedentary you are especially if you're in a dark place again your brain's not receiving the cues that it's daytime and it's time to be awake and capitalize on our resources so it's telling you it's time to rest tryptophan is used to make serotonin serotonin makes melatonin when serotonin and melatonin levels rise other hormones like norepinephrine go down so not only are we adding something that helps us sleep which is the melatonin it helps us drift off but our excitatory neurochemicals and those neurochemicals associated with the hpa axis and the stress response go down so as we go to sleep and get sleepy our hpa axis kind of goes to sleep itself if it is revved up because of stress or whatever pain then we are not going to get quality sleep if that norepinephrine stays up your serotonin and melatonin are going to stay lower too much or too little serotonin impacts mood and symptoms of depression and sleep deprivation are very similar including altered feeding and sleeping habits fatigue and difficulty concentrating one of the first things i do with clients who have major depressive disorder is try to help them reset their circadian rhythms if they still need to take naps during the day because they're just that fatigued keeping them to less than 30 minutes etc sleep hurdles drugs like caffeine pseudofed diet pills pre-workout supplements nicotine adhd medications can impair sleep our sedatives like anti-anxiety medications and barbiturates can help us get to sleep it may not be the highest quality of sleep but a lot of times especially with some of your anti-anxiety medications the rebound anxiety when that medication wears off can be extremely stimulating so if they take a short acting um, benzo then in you know two to four hours they may be waking up from their sleep sort of in a panic benadryl um, or diphenhydramine is found in a lot of the over-the-counter sleep aids it's an antihistamine it is going to uh, help people drift off to sleep faster but it may impact their quality opiates or opioids any of your pain medications that are opioid based tend to be system depressants and may make people feel sleepier without actually improving their sleep quality and we talked about alcohol earlier it improves sleep the first half of the night but it suppresses REM sleep and it really messes up sleep the last half of the night when it is exiting the body physical conditions like pain uh, can keep us up that's a sleep hurdle there if we're in pain and I tore my meniscus a couple of weeks ago and before I got my knee brace and everything whenever I would roll over in bed I would wake up in agony so you know that wasn't a good thing um, pain can keep you awake and pain also keeps that HPA axis activated we want to help people address you know injury pain but also pain due to poor or poor ergonomics you know if you're sleeping and you can feel your neck is kinking up when you're trying to go to sleep that's probably going to make it harder to get quality sleep good sleep ergonomics is important you can google it and find uh, diagrams that show people that basically your spine should stay in alignment if you are going to sleep on your side then you need a pillow that is going to keep your head here and not like this um or cr crooked up um 
So you want to make sure that you look for a side sleeping pillow. Likewise, if you sleep on your back, you don't want a huge pillow that's going to push your chin to your chest and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's one of those easier things. Um, stretching can be helpful before bed. I got one of those foam rollers, and I find it's really helpful to use before I go to bed, especially after day, days that I lift, because it helps reduce uh, or eliminate a lot of the lactic acid from my sore muscles, and it makes it easier to sleep. Pregnancy, PMS, postpartum, and we'll add, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, menopause here. All of these, because of our hormone changes during these periods, can affect temperature regulation. It also impacts serotonin levels. Changes in estrogen uh, affects the availability of serotonin. And, you know, all of these things can just cause general discomfort. Recognizing the impact of these physical conditions on our sleep quality and the impact of poor sleep quality on our mood is so important. Sleep apnea, we've already talked about when people have obstructive sleep apnea, they actually stop breathing multiple times during the night. That increases that HPA axis activation because your body goes, oh crap, you forgot to breathe, which means that norepinephrine, cortisol go up, serotonin, melatonin go down, quality of sleep not so good. Allergies, including sinus congestion and coughing. You may not wake up coughing. You may, you know, your partner may tell you, oh, you're coughing all night long. And you're like, oh, had no idea. But if you are doing that, you're probably not getting quality sleep. Consider a HEPA filter. Change your sheets regularly. Um, use the allergy pr protectors on your pillows. Um, encourage people to keep the animals out of their room. That's one I break all the time. Restless leg syndrome can keep people from getting good sleep. That's one of those that sometimes can be addressed with nutritional interventions. Sometimes it's caused by iron deficiency. Other times it requires medication to alter those dopamine levels. But RLS is, you know, a real impediment to quality sleep. And head injury, who knew? Especially injury to the front part of the brain can cause sleep problems. Now, you think front part of the brain, that must be, you know, going headlong into something. Well, that can be. But if you get a concussion, you know, think about your brain as sort of suspended in fluid, and it bounces around in there. So if you get hit from the back, your brain may bounce forward and then bounce back. If you get hit from the front, you know, it may bounce back and then bounce forward again. So either way, you know, if you get hit from the front or the back, you could have injury to the prefrontal cortex in the front part of the brain. That's also important to remember for youth who may be, for example, football players or even, you know, other sports, basketball players. If they fall down and they conk their head on the, on the court, you know, that could, even if they don't lose consciousness, it could cause some, a little bit of damage, um, injury, br bruising to the brain. Stress hormones, cortisol and thyroxine, can create agitation, insomnia, and even sugar cravings. When cortisol goes up, it causes the blood body to secrete a whole bunch of blood sugar because it says, we need to fight or flee, we need to fight or flee, we got to have energy. If there's not enough sugar, or if the body thinks it's running low on sugar, then you may have sugar cravings to support that. Low levels of cortisol can be associated with inability to handle stress, extreme fatigue, low libido, and mood instability. Estrogen, as I said earlier, increases norepinephrine and serotonin levels, um, and interestingly enough, decreases dopamine. Remember, dopamine is our go-get-it chemical, our perseveration chemical. Um, so it's interesting to note that estrogen impacts three of our main mood chemicals. Testosterone also does. Progesterone helps balance estrogen, promote sleep, and has a natural calming effect. Abnormal levels of progesterone can cause insomnia and contribute to irritability. Now, this is especially true if the progesterone levels are low, but, you know, each person is a little bit different, and it's all about the balance between the different types of estrogen and progesterone and in that individual person. 
which is why, you know, a lot of women that I work with that are on birth control or taking hormone replacement therapy, it takes a minute to get the right balance of hormones in order for them to feel like themselves again. As light increases, so do our motivating chemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol. As light decreases, the body secretes serotonin that is converted into melatonin. Well, how does that happen? We have a little organ in our brain that receives light sensors from, and, and the especially blue light, that tells our brain it's time to be awake. And when we get blue light um, messages, then we tend to be more awake. We tend to have more norepinephrine, more cortisol, less melatonin. Physical cues that can help us reset our circadian rhythm, if you will, or help us set our circadian rhythm. The unalarm clock, you know, that gets you up. And a lot of us, if you get up the same time every day at a certain point, a lot of times you're waking up just right before your alarm clock. That's your circadian rhythm going, oh, it's time to be awake. Eating meals, if you eat at roughly the same time each day, uh, can be a cue that it's time to do something. A lot of times for little kids, they eat dinner, they take a bath, they read a story, they go to bed. So eating dinner is the beginning of their sleep routine. Coming home from work is a cue to a lot of us that, hey, it's time to start settling down. And you may notice a notable drop in your energy level when you walk in and you set all your stuff down in the foyer and it's just like, oh, I made it through another day. And then certain other routines, and when I work with people to develop sleep routines, I tell them, try to figure out three things that you can do pretty consistently just about any night. And, you know, brushing your teeth and taking off your makeup or whatever, that can be stage one. And then what do you do? Y'all who've been in this uh, class before heard me talk about it. I play words with friends. and. That cues my brain. The only time I do that is at night when I'm trying to wind down because it helps. I don't think about anything else. I'm focused on, you know, finding the highest point word. And it helps my brain settle down and it cues me to sleep. I also uh, dim the lights. I don't stay up in the well-lit area of the living room uh, because that helps my brain recognize, okay, lights are going down. We're playing Scrabble. It's time to start getting ready for bed. Exercise helps reduce cortisol levels, especially if you exercise at about 40% of your uh, heart rate max, which is not high. For me, it's about 98 beats a minute, which, you know, it's a moderate walk. It's not anything too intense. Exercise also increases serotonin levels and can help in reducing aches and pains, which can keep people awake. Think about if you've been in the car for six hours driving somewhere. And you get up and you're just like, oh, every part of me hurts. You know, those aches and pains, we need to stay in motion and it keeps our joints lubricated and all that stuff. Stress, racing thoughts, ruminations, and high levels of fight or flight hormones can also keep us awake. I encourage people, remember blue light is bad. So I encourage people to keep a flashlight by their bed that has a red light to it, just like exit signs. Um, so if they think of something that they've got to remember, quote unquote, they can write it down on a, a notepad right next to their bed. They don't disrupt their night vision and they get it out of their head. So they don't sit there going, okay, I got to remember that tomorrow I need to take the trash out. Got to remember to take the trash out. Just write it down and then you can let your brain relax. Ruminations are kind of the same way. If you keep thinking over something over and over again, a lot of times, sometimes people can write it down and get it out of their head. Other times, I encourage them, you know, since you're laying down to go to sleep, let's try to focus on something different. For me, I will lay down, and if I'm stressed about something, I will focus on planning my garden for the next season because that's something that I can sort of visualize in my mind. And again, it's something that redirects my attention, and it requires just enough focus to... Um, keep me from thinking of other things, 
but not, it's not stressful at all. And before I know it, I've drifted off to sleep. <clears throat> For sleep hygiene, encourage people to create a wind down ritual. Those three things. Now, it doesn't mean you have to go to sleep every night exactly at 10 o'clock or 8 o'clock or whenever it is you go to sleep. But it's something that cues your body around that time that it's going to be time to go to sleep, whatever it is for you. But encourage people to do it habitually. Reduce or eliminate exposure, exposure to blue light one, preferably two hours before bed. You can get blue light filters that you plug into your TV. I mean... It, Gives them a little bit of a yellow hue. But if you insist on watching TV up until the time you go to sleep, that they are very, very helpful. You can also get blue light filters on any of your mobile devices or your laptop. Again, puts a weird orange hue over it. But it, if you insist on being on that device up until bedtime, then that will at least pre uh, prevent your brain from getting mixed signals that... You know, am I awake? Am I asleep? Light bulbs. Ideally, an hour or two before bed, turning down the lights and using light bulbs that are yellow in nature. And interestingly, if you go to, you know, the store, you can find them. And a lot of times they're outdoor light bulbs that are designed to bring for, for um, insects and they're, they're yellow, <clears throat> but they don't have the blue tint in them. And they are much easier on your night vision. It's going to be dim in there. It's going to be kind of like, you know, reading by candlelight or something. But that's what you want when you're trying to wind down. It's enough light. I can do my crochet and stuff. Not enough light to easily read microtype. But ideally, you're not doing that um, when you're trying to wind down. Go to bed at roughly the same time every night. If one night you're going to go to a Christmas party or something, you know, more power to you. Just get back on the, the schedule the next night. This is not meant to make people's lives miserable or mechanized. Have people eliminate as much light as possible, um, including considering a sleep mask. Even when I've got all the light off in my room and there are nights that the moon, especially when we have a full moon, which is a blue light, that it is so bright and it even comes through the the slats on my on my on my blinds and it makes it bright in my room um, the other day I woke up and I thought it was actually morning because the moon was so bright coming into my room so a sleep mask is helpful if people are willing to use it <clears throat> eliminate as much noise as possible sometimes that means earplugs some people want to watch TV until they fall asleep. Some people have small children at home, so they're not willing to do that. Okay, you know, not everybody's going to do everything. If you don't want to have earplugs in because you like watching TV until you go to sleep, which, you know, some people do, not going to take that away from them. Um, getting headphones that are noise canceling. So when the TV goes off, the input stops, but it also adds an element of noise canceling so you don't hear the dogs bark or the crickets or the, you know, traffic outside or whatever it is. Don't exer oh, you can also consider using white noise. If you live in an apartment where there's a lot of tra road traffic or you, you can hear your neighbors, white noise machines like we use in our offices can be helpful for improving sleep. Now, it is noise, but it is a constant noise as opposed to that intermittent sound of cars rushing by and then silence and then cars rushing by or something. Don't exercise heavily or take a hot bath within two hours of bed. The body needs to cool down to go into those later stages of sleep, which is why they recommend that you keep your sleeping area between 68 and 72 degrees. It sounds wonderful. I'm not willing to do that during the summer because um, I'm, I'm cheap. I'm just not willing to do it. But there are cooling pillows and there are actually cooling systems you can get for your bed now. Some of them are really awesome. They're like a gel cooling thing and they're expensive, but they look really awesome. Um, and then there are others that basically just have a 
fan with a hose that goes between your um, goes right underneath your your top sheet so it keeps air circulating under the blanket all night long it keeps you from getting sweaty I don't know if that would keep me up or not but if you look at um, the bedding solutions out there there are a lot of them the old-fashioned memory foam beds are some of the worst for holding in heat so looking for alternatives as, as much as possible in order to help people cool down um, we lose a lot of our heat through our feet and our head if you have somebody who tends to get hot a lot encouraging them not to sleep with socks on and uh, one of my friends suggested you know you can sleep with your covers on but keep your feet out and i actually found that that works pretty well keeping the room cool Consider a cooling pillow or mattress topper and avoid anything that might get you upset within an hour or so of bed. This can include watching the news, social media, um, calling your mother if she irritates you, whatever it is. Within an hour of bedtime, that is your sanctuary time. Try to use it for you. And if you can't get an, squeak an hour out, try to at least squeak 30, 30 minutes out. Reduce or eliminate caffeine, preferably 12 hours before bed. Drink the majority of fluids during the day. Even those of us who don't have bladder or prostate problems, if you drink a lot of fluid late at night, you're going to wake up and have to go to the bathroom. The, if you have to go to the bathroom, try to keep, again, red light, night lights, throughout the house so you don't have to turn on the overhead lights in order to make sure that the seat is actually down on the toilet before you sit down. Because um, I'll tell you, you'll wake up if you sit into, into a cold toilet. Uh, if you're working with somebody who's having a, a, a male who's having to get up multiple times during the night, especially an older male, you know, have them talk to their doctor about you know, whether they should start taking something like beta cysterol or uh, whatever in order to help them not have to go to the bathroom during the night. Uh, keep an air purifier in the room if you've got allergies, especially a HEPA air, fil uh, air purifier. When I have one running at night, it bugs me, that hum in the background. I don't know. I'm weird that way. But I keep my door shut to my bedroom and I let it run all day long. So then... You know theoretically it's purified at night keep animals off the bed well that's ideal because you know like the puppy i have right now wants to sleep between my legs all night long and every time i go to roll over she's there and i'm like lily you gotta move so i can roll over um not only do they potentially disrupt your sleep or take over your bed their dander can be can also be bothersome or when they're having their little dreams or nightmares, you know, they have the little puppy dreams where they're running and barking at something, um, it may wake you up. So ideally, don't have them in the room, but you know, like I said, that's one I'm not willing to do. Make the bedroom a place of relaxation and sleep. That is not the place you want to go to be fighting with your significant other. It's not the place you want to go to be doing bills. Uh, keep it a place where you can go to and relax. It's your sanctuary. And in that, make it an environment that's appealing and to you, whatever that looks like, whatever that smells like, whatever that sounds like. As I said earlier, keep a red light, night light, or um, flashlight by your bed and a notepad to write down anything that pops into your head. And weighted blankets are really very ubiquitous now, which is awesome, and help people, some people, get to sleep easier there is helpful with people who have mild levels of restless leg um, it's helpful for people who have who are on the spectrum who have anxiety issues and some of us that just like to feel nestled in um, weighted blankets now the general rule they use is um, what is it one pound of weighted blanket for every 10 pounds of body weight so if you weigh 120 pounds, then you're going to get a 12-pound blanket. I personally find that to be way too light, but that's me. I like having a, a heavy blanket over top of me. 
encourage people to experiment start light they can always get a second one to put on top of it keep daytime naps to under 45 minutes preferably under 30 so you don't trigger that sleep cycle to start consider diffusing essential oils lavender chamomile and patchouli have been found to help some people sleep some people find them absolutely obnoxious smell it go to the health food store or wherever take a whiff of it if you smell it and you're just like ew then it's not going to help you sleep if you smell it and it just smells heavenly then that might be something that is triggering the right receptors in your body to help you sleep catnip is another one of those that is a very quote earthy smell kind of like patchouli uh, that is a relaxant for humans not for cats it's a stimulant for cats so you don't want to let kitty in the bedroom if you're diffusing catnip but uh, i actually prefer it to valerian valerian essential oil is another uh, calming essential oil that's used to help people get to sleep again for certain cats it can be a stimulant valerian and catnip are both very potent uh, aromas to cats so if you have them and you're using either one of those essential oils you know buyer beware and as i said earlier select the right pillow insufficient quality sleep contributes to fatigue difficulty concentrating reduced reaction time apathy you know a lot of symptoms of depression which came first the depressive symptoms or the sleep deprivation and disrupted sleep stuff doesn't really matter we know that in order to help people really experience some relief from those symptoms we need to help them get their circadian rhythms and their sleep you know in order a little bit doesn't have to be perfect but we know that that has to happen during deep sleep is when researchers think the brain rests and rebalances over time sleep deprivation can cause changes in all of your neurotransmitter levels your glutamate your GABA your uh, serotonin dopamine norepinephrine acetylcholine you know if you start getting all of those out of whack it's gonna be hard to have your optimal level of health and mental health and it will all, can also cause changes in immune functioning most people could benefit from auditing their sleep quality reducing light reducing noises reducing bathroom trips reducing wake-ups because of allergies or being too hot or too cold um, and stopping caffeine six preferably 12 hours before bed on that uh, note of noise and you have to figure out how you're going to deal with it or your client has to figure out how they're going to deal with it if they happen to be sharing a room with somebody who is a snorer even if they don't have sleep apnea snoring can keep people up which is where the earplugs and noise canceling headphones may come in helpful handy if you're only willing to change one thing this month to start being happier and healthier more energetic and clear-headed sleep might be a great place to start so if you are working with a client who is super pre-contemplative or just you know just doesn't even have energy to think about where to begin sleep might be something that they're actually willing to look at addressing and there's tons of additional resources in the powerpoint if you want to take a look at those as well are there any questions I know a lot of times as clinicians we really focus on the cognitive and the social aspects of mood issues but i think it's so important that we also are at least aware of the impact of biology and biological factors Between writing notes, filing insurance claims, and scheduling with clients, it can be hard to stay organized. That's why I recommend Therapy Notes. Their easy-to-use platform lets you manage your practice securely and efficiently. 
Visit TherapyNotes.com to get two free months of Therapy Notes by just using the promo code CEU when you sign up for a free trial at TherapyNotes.com. If this podcast helps you help your clients or yourself, please support us by purchasing your CEUs at allceus.com or getting your agency to sponsor an episode. A direct link to the on-demand CEUs for this podcast is at allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. That's allceus.com slash podcast CEUs. To sponsor an episode of Counselor Toolbox and reach over 50,000 clinicians per week, go to allceus.com slash sponsor. Thank you.